Do you ever find yourself wondering, hey, what's that nondescript green thing over there? Well, today it's dandelions. So we're starting off today with what's probably the most easily identifiable and widely known invasive plant in North America. If there's a place where it could be growing, it probably is growing there already. And so by invasive, I mean this Canada isn't its native habitat. It came over to us from Europe actually, brought over by the Europeans, probably on the Mayflower. And that said though, there is some confusion because the term dandelion isn't necessarily just one species, it can actually refer to an entire genus or a group of species, several of which are actually native to North America, but those are a lot less common and kind of relegated to certain areas. And so if you see a dandelion, chances are it's one of the two invasive species. Unlike a lot of other plants which were brought over either accidentally or as ornamentals, uh, the dandelion was actually brought over as a food plant. Now, most people know a dandelion when they see one, but sometimes there's confusion over plants that look a lot like dandelions but aren't. So let's take a closer look. Now, strictly speaking, what we're looking at here isn't technically a single flower, it's actually a uh, group of flowers. The dandelion is in the aster family. The, one of the marking features of the aster family is they have what's called the capitulum. It's not single flowers, but these groups of flowers that look like single flowers. So hence its older name, compositae, or like composite flowers. So um, as you can see, if I'm going to take this apart, these are individual flowers. That right there, you can see, there's a, a petal on there. So this, by probably the day after tomorrow, will be an individual seed. And while dandelions are actually a great source of food for a lot of pollinators, they're able to make seeds without being pollinated as well, which is part of why they spread so readily. And these, technically speaking, also aren't petals on the very outside, they only look like them. So as you can see here, these are flowers a day or two after when they've each flower has turned into a seed. Um, but the next identifying feature of the dandelion is the milky sap, which if you've ever broken a dandelion I'm sure you've seen. And contrary to what I thought as a young child, this is not where white glue comes from, but it, it, it does contain latex and it has recently been investigated for whether it might be used to make rubber. And it, certain species, different species will have different compounds in the latex, and some do actually make a pretty good rubber, it turns out. Whether that's commercially viable to do large scale, that remains to be seen. So, latex, why, why does it have latex? Well, that's a matter of ongoing debate. There's actually about 6% of temperate plants contain some form of latex. And while the, the chemicals in the latex vary a lot from plant to plant, it seems the reason with the most supporting evidence is as a defense against insects. It's noted that concentrations of defensive chemicals against insects are a lot higher in the latex than in the rest of the plant, and when a plant is injured it'll actually move latex towards that injured spot. So one thing it can do, for instance, is to gum up the jaws of the insect that's trying to bite into it. Also note that the stem here is hollow, which really isn't so weird if you think about it from an efficiency point of view. I mean, there's only one flower per stalk, and it'll take a day or two to rise up out of the ground, it'll bloom for a day, close up and set seed for a day, and then the next day you got this poof of seeds. So. If it's such a short-term thing, like a week at most, why would it put more resources and energy into growing something that isn't going to last? So to be sure it's a dandelion, we have to look at the leaves. 
If it is a dandelion, it should have what's called a basal rosette, where all the leaves come out from a central location at the base. It's the stem tissue. It's right between those leaves and the root. So the leaves are actually where dandelions get their name from. So you can see it's kind of sharp and toothy, and the word dandelion comes from the French uh, don de lion, uh, meaning lion's tooth. So you can kind of see that there. Lastly, there's the taproot. Dandelions are perennial, meaning they survive through the winter year after year. In cold climates like this, generally the leaves will die back in the winter, but in the spring it's able to regrow quite quickly from the root. And that's why the root is as fleshy and thick as it is. It's because it stores a lot of nutrients so that it can spring back quickly in the spring. And that's also why, as many gardeners know, if you try to remove the plant but don't fully get rid of the root, the leaves can quite easily grow back even just within the same summer. So these were brought over as a food plant, but which parts are edible? Well, fortunately, the whole thing. So the most used part is probably the leaf. It, it can be a little bit bitter as far as greens go, but if you either pick it young, you maybe mix it with other greens that aren't bitter, or if you cook it too, that's, it dilutes the bitterness and it comes out a lot better. You can see this in, as far as Middle Eastern cooking, parts of Southeast Asia, European, so it's quite widespread. The roots, if you dry them out and then roast them, you can make a beverage fairly similar to coffee. Now, I, I'm not a coffee drinker myself, really, so I've never tried most of the wild coffee substitutes, but I've heard it's pretty good. They use it as coffee? Sort of. It's not a caffeinated beverage. It's more just another beverage that comes out tasting somewhat similar to coffee. It's a, a roasted and steeped beverage. The seeds are edible, and they kind of have a nice flavor to them, but with how small they are and with having to separate the fluffy parachutes from them, it's, it'd be incredibly tedious to harvest them as, as a food source. I mean, I guess you could keep them together if eating cotton balls is something you would enjoy. But my favorite part to use is the flower, or capitulum. Now there's quite a bit you can do with this actually. It makes a really good tea. You can use the whole thing or you can take out just the inner yellow parts if you want. There's a bit of bitterness that comes with using the green parts as well. Uh, if you're from certain parts of the states you might have had dandelion wine before or maybe dandelion jelly that's generally made from the inner yellow parts as well. But my favorite thing to do with them personally is fry them. It's a little bit tedious collecting them especially if you choose to use the unopened buds instead of the whole flowers. But if you take a bunch of them, roll them in egg, roll them in flour, salt, and a bit of spices maybe, fry that in hot butter, that right there is the bee's knees of American cuisine as far as I'm concerned. So there's a lot of other uses I could go into, but those are the basics. And the nice thing here too, as far as wild edible plants, go. It's invasive. There's no shortage. I mean a lot of other plants I would recommend forage responsibly. But here, you want to wipe out an entire population of dandelions? Go for it. You want to conk them out from existence in your entire state? Excellent. You may be doing local native plants a favor in the process. So hopefully now you have a bit more appreciation for the humble dandelion. Most plants are pretty interesting when you take a closer look. But anyway, that's all I have for this week. If you have any corrections, suggestions, or disparaging remarks, feel free to comment. Until next time.